think of the state of Louisiana, the outline of the state sort of looks like a big boot, or at least that's what it used to look like. But over the past 50 years, a lot of the low-lying land that is the Louisiana Bayou has started to disappear. And what used to be a boot, or the sole of a boot, now looks sort of like lace. The three main factors that are accelerating and have accelerated land loss in coastal Louisiana are the damming of the Mississippi, the oil and gas industry, and sea level rise. They've lost uh, land equal in size to the state of Delaware over the past 50 years. When I first went down to the Isle de Jean Charles, I figured when you flood three times in five years, you leave. I mean, I thought I thought it was like a very rational decision-making process, and I realized very quickly when I got to the island that it's anything but and that everyone has sort of an individual pathway through that decision about leaving a place that you've called home. At the height of population density, there are about 300 people on the island. When I first got there, this guy named Chris Bernay, who's like the local island historian, was about one of 30. <laughs> You know, a number of these are photos that I took of Chris's photos. All of these trees here in the photo, they're living, wonderful hardwood trees. And when you go out to Chris's house, you know, a lot of this is open water, and a lot of these trees are just skeletons of themselves. In Louisiana, I started to be able to see, in a very, like, visual, visceral way, that um, that we're losing tidal wetlands species and that the things that are rooted in place and can't move away from higher tides and stronger storms are perishing. And you spend a lot of time out there and these cypress, these live oaks that are just skeletons of their former selves start to sink into, started to sink into my thinking um, and helped me sort of begin to embrace retreat as as a necessary adaptation form, because if you can't move away from the risk, at some point it will do you in. And I think we see that with these trees. The more I have spent time in coastal communities, the more I've wondered um, why some of them remain in place when they have repeat flooding issues. and. The very simple answer is, if you have a mortgage and you live in the floodplain, you are required by law to have a flood insurance policy. Those policies are all run through the National Flood Insurance Program, and that program demands that if you make a claim and you get money for your claim, you rebuild in place. You talk to people who live in these places, and they like to leave. They're like, you know, the first flood, I used some of my savings, I redid my kitchen. The second flood, I didn't have the money to do that, so I did the basics to get back in the house. The third flood, you know, if they're gonna come back into that house, it usually means dipping into their retirement savings if they have it. And at the same time, because their house has flooded a bunch of times, it's also losing value. We're talking about, you know, lower middle class people being stuck in homes that are consistently losing value and not having a pathway towards physical or financial safety. We hear a lot about how different big coastal cities are designing interesting flood resilient infrastructure. People from all of these cities meet and they information share around what's working, what's not working. And one thing that I've realized is that we really need a kind of information sharing network like that for small town America, uh, for little communities that are really far away from the centers of power. Flood Forum USA, which started in the middle of the 2017 hurricane season, has started to address that need because it really empowers those living on the front lines of, of this planetary phenomenon. Can you see my screen? We can see the screen, yes. Fantastic, okay. Uh, so just a reminder, Flood Forum USA helps people harmed by flooding get heard, organized and supported and several of you are, are on these photos. Thank you for your work. 
Um, first, let me say we live on a small island. It's probably about eight miles by 14 miles, and that's it. That's the size of the island. Um, so when Hurricane Sandy happened on the south shore, many people were impacted all over the island. According to the official numbers, 24 people died. So it is a nationwide coalition of flood survivors. And one of the things that the organizers do is they connect communities with pro bono hydrologists and pro bono um, environmental lawyers who then go out to the community, will do a hydrological assessment to try to identify the flood risks. And together, the hydrologists and the community leaders create an action plan that they can then bring to local politicians. They have um, collective power by grouping together. And I think that that's a huge source of hope for me. But if we don't create the policies now to figure out how to help everyone make the transition, it will be devastating. We need the stories now that tell us how to do this and we need the policy that helps those down the line, you know, get out of harm's way. In order to mandatory evacuation of the island of Broad Channel, all Broad Channel residents are urged to comply with this evacuation request. I feel like I'm always talking about how important retreat is and no one wants to hear it, but it's really important. I mean, but the alternative is like... Turn into one of those trees, die in place. Like, that's the alternative. So, uh, yeah, that's it, more or less. And, you know, lose, lose all of your equity in the process. Lose your equity, then die in place. I was teaching at the College of Staten Island when Sandy arrived, and this was, for many, the third storm in a four-year time frame. Residents would tell me, Sandy was the 500-year storm, Irene was the 200-year storm, the year before that we had a 300-year rain event, so in three years, we've had a thousand years of storms. Their patience had reached a limit. You had nine different communities along Staten Island's eastern shore start to petition um, the local and state government to purchase and demolish their homes. They wanted the land where their homes had stood to be to go back to nature, to act as a buffer in the storms to come. And in three of those communities, the governor, Governor Cuomo, agreed to purchase the homes. And so over 600 homes were purchased and demolished in Staten Island after Sandy. When you, you know, relocate the residents of Oakwood Beach, you're also giving the tidal wetland species that are dependent upon that place the chance to ultimately move up and in as well. Also in a place like Oakwood Beach, if you have storm surge with a storm event, tidal wetlands can essentially slow down the water. They slow down wave action. They can make those waves less big. The waves hit the marsh grasses and start to dissipate. That's one of the things that they could have used a lot more of in Staten Island during Sandy. Because when the water came, in many places it came in very quickly. 50% of the Sandy-related deaths took place in Staten Island. Almost all were on top of places that had been tidal wetlands, but that got paved over. I think that we need to sort of get to that place where retreat isn't so emotionally loaded. And people are moving away from risk. And they're doing so in ways that can often help them maintain their community. So it doesn't have to be as emotionally or economically devastating as we think it could be. If you go back out there today, the wetlands are coming back. The Spartina Alterna Flora is coming back. I was last out there in June and there were a bunch of deer and I'd never seen deer in Oakwood before. There were ospreys. I'd never seen ospreys in Oakwood before. So I did really get the feeling like, you know, sort of one definition of home gave way to another and was giving in the short term um, the opportunity for these wetland species to survive and thrive. It was, it's, it was really incredible to watch. Oh,